I've been asked to do a presentation, um, a riveting presentation at that, in order to get um, some information out on cardiovascular risk reduction. So the first thing I like to do whenever I give a talk, mostly for me to kind of break things down. On a recent trip, um, I took this picture because I was like, oh, that's nice. There's a picture of a, a medical symbol. Um, so I took that picture and I thought this kind of ironic that it says number 16 twice, just in case you didn't get it the first time. The medical symbol is the caduceus. Um, and this is a symbol of Hermes or Mercury in Greek and Roman mythology. Uh, it's generally identified with messengers, merchants, and thieves, which I thought was interesting because I thought this was a sign for doctors in, in medicine. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineer or the Army uh, Medical Corps in 1902 were the ones that seemed to have started us off maybe on the wrong foot. Uh, the rod of Eclepius is actually the symbol that's uh, what we look for for medicine, not the caduceus. So one of the things that's interesting about this statue is that Clepius uh, and his snake intertwined around the rod there. Um, this is the actual symbol of, of medicine. This is the god of medicine. Um, and what's also interesting about this picture is one of the theories that this worm or this snake may have been the guinea worm. Uh, I just thought that was all interesting. Without any more ado, let's launch into the next slide. So cardiovascular disease is common, okay? This has a couple parts to it. Let's see if we hit this slide a couple more times. Let's see what happens. Oh, look at that. There's some graphics. It's very common. Next slide, please. Okay, heart disease is the leading cause of death for men, women, people of most ethnic and racial groups in the United States, okay? Every 34 seconds, someone dies of a cardiovascular disease-related issue. Now, some of you may say, this Dr. Schutz has died many times over in trying to get this plane off the ground, but hold on one second. We have much more to talk about tonight. There's been about 700,000 people that died in 2020 from heart disease in the United States. All right, I like maps. If you happen to catch my hypertension talk uh, last year, let's go to the next slide real quick. Big fan of maps. So maps show us where the issues are. So this map is uh, heart disease deaths of all genders, all races, uh, races from 2018 to 2020, age greater than 35. Um, I think that maps kind of tell us where the problems are. This map or this, uh, this graphic is gonna come up again a couple times over in this talk because I think it's really important for us to isolate where there are problems. I'd like to think in Colorado, with the coloration being as light as it is, that we don't have any problems, but the fact of the matter is this problem is, is all across the United States. It's quite heavy in the South. It follows along the Mississippi and Missouri river basins. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and you, you're gonna have to hit this one a couple times as well. Cardiovascular disease is costly. It's exceptionally costly, all right? Let's go to the next slide so we could just get a couple pieces of data to look at from current until what is project, predicted to be 2035. So these are the, the cost of cardiovascular disease with indirect costs as well as direct costs. You can see current, we're clocking in at about 555 billion with projections over $1 trillion in about 10 years. Um, next slide. Okay, for every $6 spent on healthcare, a dollar goes to cardiovascular disease. That's, that's rather profound. And as it turns out, there's about a billion dollars a day spent on cardiovascular disease. And by 2030, the projection is over $2 billion a day. Let's hit one more slide. This is a pause slide because we finally got this thing going. So I have your attention. We have a very common issue, a very expensive problem. You know, the first question is, where do we even start with all this? Next slide. Well, where we start is back in 2010, we had this, uh, this metric, this approach that was started by the American Heart Association. I, I know that there's some people out there like, wait, wait, you know, this is the simple seven, how it becomes the essential eight. Bear with me, all right? 2010, they launched this program in an attempt to 
diminish cardiovascular disease and increase uh, our overall cardiovascular health. Um, there's a whole bunch of metrics you can pick from, but they chose these seven. You know, and in the beginning, um, you try and figure out what you want to deal with. You want to make it simple. You've got to make this stuff simple. You know, for patients, but honest to God, for doctors and and practicing uh, or uh, uh, medical practitioners as well. You know, if it's too complicated, we can't follow. You can't follow. It just it becomes a mess. So the goal back in 2010 with the introduction of Life Simple 7 was to reduce the 10-year cardiovascular disease and stroke uh, by 20%. So we're trying to get a 20% reduction in cardiovascular disease and stroke. But again, the secondary goal was to have improvement in cardiovascular health. There was an article, sadly, in 1993 in Preventive Medicine by Breslow and Breslow. And guess what? 1993, this team came together with seven habits that would lead to a healthier and longer life. 1993, 2010, seems like it took a while to get that off the ground. Okay, next slide, please. So the simple seven on the graphic before, I'm trying to keep it simple. Next slide, four modifiable. And by modifiable, I mean lifestyle oriented. Uh, the other three were biometric, um, either physically measured or with labs. Okay, let's just get going with this. Next slide. Okay, number one, you must quit tobacco. Heavily modifiable. A lot of people around this neck of the woods do not smoke, which is wonderful for practicing medicine, specifically cardiology in, in Colorado. There's still a ton of people who unfor unfortunately smoke. Uh, in 2010, they didn't understand that e-cigarettes and vaping were going to be around. So they added that in in 2022. But I just want to stress, you know, traditional cigarettes, it's one of the leading causes of preventable death in the United States. Um, up to one third of cardiovascular deaths are attributed to tobacco use. Um, I love this poster because it's just so god awful at this day and age. Uh, this is probably from the 50s. You've got this wonderful chap here sitting smoking a cigarette. You know, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. That's great. I especially like the fact that they made the M and more and the D and doctors red. So you could kind of really sink in that we're dealing with medical doctors here. Um, we've come a long way from this. Let's get the next slide. I'm going to check and make sure we're on the same. Yeah, so here's here's that map guy again. So we're showing where there's a lot of smoking still occurring. And ironically, strangely, sadly, it follows the, uh, the same graphic that we were looking at before where the highest incidence of heart disease is. You know, so you're looking in the south, you're following along the Mississippi, Ohio river basins. You're also following where tobacco use uh, and, and tobacco growth growing uh, was, uh, were made uh, or used, I'm sorry. Next slide. There we go. All right. So what I really like about the American Heart Association Simple 7 is just that. It's quite simple. They've got one page on each of these different metrics to try and tell you what you need to do to modify the risk factor. How to quit tobacco. There's two key parts here. Number one, education. And number one, making a plan. Okay. As far as the education, once again, we like to reiterate, you quit smoking within one year of quitting, your risk for heart disease goes down by half, okay? Smoking damages the circulatory system and increases your risk for multiple other diseases. We know all this stuff. It's like, you know, the horse has been beaten, but we still have to continue to educate patients on the fact that this is a highly modifiable risk factor. In order to quit, you've got to do a couple things. Rare are the people that wake up and just say, I'm going to quit smoking today. You have to set a date. You need to choose, you know, whether you're going to do this cold turkey if you're not smoking that many cigarettes or gradually. You have to decide if you're going to work with a healthcare professional or actually like community support. Prepare yourself by getting rid of some of the things that make you think about smoking and then quit. Uh, a lot of this also has to do with dealing with urges. This is the stuff on the right-hand side here. We're going to increase activity. You're going to hear that over and over with the next few risks that we're going to talk about. 
I'm a huge proponent of making sure that you do this with other people, not necessarily other smokers. Certainly that makes sense uh, because you're going to help each other out. But I think you've got to really you've got to lean on people in order to be successful with making sure that this this we quit this um, strength in numbers, I like to say. All right, let's go to the next slide here. Next slide, we need to eat better, also modifiable. We're trying to boost the increase in fruits and vegetables. We're trying to limit sugary drinks. This one's kind of easy, uh, you know, cut back or stop the, the, the sodas, the pops, uh, depends on where you are uh, geographically as to which of those resonates with you. Alcohol, we're gonna come back to that one um, because there's a lot more traction on the alcohol use and abuse. Um, Avoid processed foods. A plant-based diet is extremely important. Uh, watch calories. This has been reworded. It used to be counting calories. We're not seeing that terminology so much versus watching. I think it's a little bit more passive. Um, and then eat at home. This picture here shows all these different fast food restaurants. You know, I did a small amount of research because I was like, what's the top thing that we eat in Colorado? I thought maybe Chipotle because it originated here. Unfortunately, I believe it's Taco Bell or uh, Subway. Um, either way, it's bad. Uh, next picture here. And I've got a lot of feedback. I'll wait here a second. Okay, this slide is showing us how to eat better. We're trying to encourage people to do more vegetables, fruits, whole grains, We're trying to get more fish. We're trying to limit the sweetened drinks, alcohol, sodium, salt, red and processed meats, refined carbohydrates. Um, and we're really trying to avoid the partially hydrogenated oils. Um, we want people to read the nutrition labels. There's a reason that there's so much been put forth in trying to put that information on the foods we eat. Again, we're seeing a repeating thing, theme. You gotta cook at home. And if there's inspiration needed, the American Heart Association website actually has quite a bit of recipes that are fairly easy to make um, and they actually turn out pretty well. Let's try the next slide here. I think we want one more, one more slide, I believe we could get to that. There we go. So we're trying to get to the move more slide. Okay. So we want people to walk more. If you've ever seen me in clinic, I'm encouraging more and more people just to do some simple walking. If you like the gym, go to the gym. If you have your favorite exercise equipment, use your exercise equipment. Too many people buy these things. They sit in the basement and they really are nice for drying clothes. Um, I like people adding time and distance. Another thing you'll hear me say in the, in the clinic, if you come in to see me is like, Go outside, pick up a stone, walk 10 minutes away from home, set it down, walk back home. There's 20 minutes of exercise. The next day, walk that 10 minutes to get to that stone, but get to that stone and get a couple more steps in. Turn around, walk back home. I, I think at the end of the day, it's about making this a habit. You've got to, you've got to get in the groove, if you will, with regular and routine exercise. Uh, I'm also a fan, once again, of partnering up. Drag someone else with you. Uh, I think the more the merrier. There'll be days when you don't feel like doing it. There'll be days when the weather outside is too cold. But I think if you have a partner or a group that you're doing this with, you will be the one to get them out. They will be the one to get you out. I'm also a big fan of, of some of the new wearable technology. I am not telling people to go buy Fitbit or an Apple Watch. It has information that will motivate you. Um, and if this is what you need to have more movement, then by all means, I think, go ahead and, and work with those things. Let's try the next slide. All right, so here's the be more active. So we're moving through these different seven, the simple seven, um, trying to get uh, the amount of information out there. We wanna keep it simple, single page, Move. They're looking for 150 minutes of exercise a week. This is not much. This is a week, over seven days, 150 minutes of moderate aerobic activity. Uh, 
I personally would go for the 75 minutes of vigorous. But if you look in the fine print there, do both. Get a little bit of moderate aerobic exercise. Get a little bit of vigorous aerobic exercise. I think we've, we've just got to work on trying to encourage people to be more active. One of the things that I think is not uh, as prevalent in these pictures, in these graphics, that I think is really, really important is the last, the bottom of this uh, single page, the kids and teens. We've got to get the kids moving more. They're looking at 60 minutes of physical activity every day. All right, so what we're trying to do is set the stage for the activity to start at a younger age and continue. Uh, we want you to walk more. We want you to stay active. You've got to keep it up, make it a habit. Repeating theme here. Let's try the next slide and see what we get with that. Against this, there we go. Oh my goodness. Love this picture. Manage weight. This is a modifiable metric. Again, we're not saying counting calories. We're going more to monitoring the calories in and monitor the calories out. I want you to calculate your BMI. Now we're starting to move into how much of this is personal responsibility. We're gonna come back to the BMI here shortly, but this is based on height and weight. Many of you can grab your phone, your tablet, your computer. You can Google, yes, the doctor said Google. You can Google you know, BMI, you plug the numbers in, it'll calculate it for you. Um, we're trying to get people to move more. So each of these starts stacking on the, um, the seven metrics. We're working with the first and we're kind of working forward with each of them afterward. Um, this picture here is a picture of the in and out four by four burger. You should never eat one of these. It's 1000 calories, 70 grams of fat, 34 of which are saturated. You're looking at about 2300 milligrams of sodium. So again, it's a beautiful thing to look at as far as a picture. You should never eat this. This was not meant for one person. If you do that, uh, please stop. It's, it's not healthy. Let's go to the next slide. How to manage your weight, keep track. Again, reduce the calories in, increase the calories out by you know, tracking the amount of calories that you eat, all right? Your phone, your, your Fitbit, your smartwatch, Samsung, Apple, whatever, all these things are gonna show you the calories. You can plug this stuff in. Again, don't necessarily find it where you have to go buy these things. There are easier things to do. Some of it is pretty straightforward. Learn your BMI. So let's go to the next slide because I think that this is important. Here's your BMI. Again, you can plug and chug on, on a computer on your phone um, to figure this out. If you're really into math, you divide your weight in pounds by your heart or by your height in inches. You're going to square your height. So weight in pounds divided by height in inches squared and then multiply this by 703. Now you understand why it's easier just to get on your phone or your tablet, plug this in, okay? It's gonna spit out a number, underweight, normal weight, overweight, obesity, all right? We're not trying to make people feel bad. We're trying to elevate the, the, the awareness of where you are and what you need to do to get things better, where you need to try and get it so that your weight uh, is in the normal range. All right. Next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about this. A lot of people hate these meds. I like this slide, control cholesterol, uh, cholesterol. This is a modifiable metric, and this is looking at fat that's either eaten or made. I personally like four numbers. For a while there, we were diving into subparticle analysis. Um, we still do that, but let's keep it simple. We look at total, cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, the good cholesterol as it's called, and LDL, the bad cholesterol as it's called. This picture is a picture of Akira Endo. So this guy worked with mushrooms uh, and ultimately had a lot to do with the first FDA approved statin, lovastatin in 1987. We'll come back to him at the end of the talk, but I think credit where credit's due. This guy had a lot to do with bringing a very important medication uh, to the forefront. Let's go to the next slide. Here's our single page, how to control your cholesterol. You know, we want you to understand the good cholesterol, HDL, the bad cholesterol, LDL. Well, this is where we start getting into something that's a little bit harder, okay? This is not necessarily a choice to eat well or exercise or quit smoking. This one needs to be, this is a lab draw. Um, and this can be done with your primary care provider. 
You know, the Nine Health Fair uh, used to do this annually as well. And it was really nice back pre-COVID um, because they would track each of your cholesterol numbers over the course of, uh, you know, the, the time you've had them done. So you could see last year's and previous years, which I thought was really important. Um, we're starting to stack on the information from before. We want you to eat smart. We want you to move more. Don't smoke. Uh, and then take your medicine as directed. Um, you know, I think it's important. We put you on these medicines. You know, number one, the doc who puts you on these medicines should talk with you about the risks and the benefits. They should talk with you about, you know, what we're going to track, what we're looking for. They should talk with you about side effects that could occur. Um, I just think that that's really important for us to have uh, um, a relationship with our patients so that you feel that we're trying to do something good for you and understand where you're coming from. Because there's a lot of concerns about these medicines for some patients. Let's try the next slide here. All right, monitor glucose. Uh, this is another modifiable metric, but this is also another one that needs to be measured. And this is glucose or sugars from foods eaten with high sugar as well as carbohydrates. Assessment of level, this is generally a blood draw. Um, there are some new wearable technologies that are coming out that are trying to bridge the gap between you know, necessarily having to go get blood drawn and having this data. We're not there yet, we're really close. Our goal is to have your glucose less than 100 milligrams per deciliter and pre-diabetic from 100 to 125. So you go get your blood work done, you look at your glucose level, and we're trying to stratify this a little bit to find out where you are and what we need to do. I put this picture of peeps up because there was a gentleman named Matt Stone. Uh, this poor guy ate 255 peeps in about five minutes. It was a world record, you know, and here I am talking about him. I'm giving, you know, him a little bit of credit. Uh, quick math, that's about 7,100 calories total, about 1,400 calories per minute. Again, don't do this. This is bad. It's, you know, look back at that four by four sandwich from, uh, you know, the, the hamburger joint. Don't, don't do this to yourself. This is 3.75 pounds of sugar in five minutes. It's not good for you. All right. Let's go to the next slide. This is the one page summary uh, that I'm a huge fan of. Understanding what it means tracking the levels. Down at the bottom there, we're trying to shoot for 100 or less. Um, and if it's 100 to 125 or greater than 125, again, I don't want to instill the fear of God in people, but I think if we start tracking some of these numbers, we start seeing where things are coming from and understanding what it means and how to change these things, I think that we're setting ourselves you know, in the direction we'd like to be. We've only got a couple more. Again, this whole presentation has been fairly discombobulated, uh, but we're getting through it, guys. Uh, let's go to the next slide. All right, track your blood pressure. Um, this is a modifiable metric. Um, if you caught my talk last year, um, we talked a lot about how to get your blood pressure, you know, devices that, that we prefer you use. I also talked quite a bit about the fact that when you go to your doctor's office, they're probably not doing it right. I'm not saying that they're doing it wrong, but you run up the stairs, you go in the door, you check in, you sit down, the medical assistant comes in, checks your blood pressure and leaves. So all this has happened in a time frame of maybe two minutes, maybe five minutes. The fact of the matter is there's a whole bunch of stuff that people should do to the degree that if you got your blood pressure checked properly, the entire amount of time you had to see your doctor would have been wasted on getting the blood pressure checked. You have to have an empty bladder, no fluorescent lights, both feet on the floor, quiet room with no one talking. We're going to check your blood pressure under your shirt. Um, someone today had their blood pressure checked, not in our office. They came in and they were joking about the fact that you had to take your shirt off. They, they were doing blood pressure checks over the shirt. You can't do that. Um, I do not like wrist cuffs. I, I think that the best cuff is the arm cuff, but I think we've just got to bring everything down. We want you to do some breathing. If you got a blood pressure like this guy right here, you probably ought to head over to the emergency department. It's just, it's, you know, but we can do this if you're rushed. We can do this if you're moving. We can do this if we don't settle down a little bit. Quick uh, definitions. The top number is called the systolic. The bottom number is diastolic. The goal period is less than 120 over less than 80. Okay. If you have a blood pressure that's a little higher than that, 
Sometimes you come in, the doctor's like, you know, it's, it's 139, it, it's okay. Maybe it is, it's probably not, all right? I also think it's really important to empower the patients. You guys who are, if there's anyone left watching this, <laughs> I wanna empower you to get some data from home, okay? Bring some data from when you checked your blood pressure at home. You come in, you're rushed, you get a 145. All the blood pressures at home are 120s. You have checked your cuff to our cuff. Your cuff gets a 140 in the office. We get a 140. I think that the data that you have at home is usable. Um, and I think that more and more people know how to do this. And I think if you don't have a cuff and you're 50 or older, you probably ought to have a cuff. Let's see what the next slide looks like. Something tells me it's going to be another one of these single page. Well, look at that. So understanding the reading, um, we're going to circle back around again at the end to talk about each of these pages, but I think it's really important for you to get a blood pressure cuff, check your blood pressure at home. If your pressure's high, think to yourself, what's going on in my life right now? Did I do some breathing before I check my pressure? Am I relaxed? If you just got off the phone and you had a heated conversation, you run up the stairs, you check your blood pressure, it's going to be high. So we have to get you in the environment where your blood pressure actually tells us what's going on. If, if you're as relaxed as me, there's no phone, you know, there's no uh, bad phone call or text message or anything like that, and your blood pressure is high, you're going to work with a healthcare professional to try and get that down, either with lifestyle modification, diet modification, or potentially medications. All right, next slide. Wait, there we go. So we have these seven metrics, okay? We tried to reduce these things down to single pages um, to try and figure out, you know, what does it mean? How are we doing? This is where I have a problem with the simple seven because the next slide, let's go to that. Okay, this is complicated. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. There's seven different metrics. There's three different columns. This was their plan back in 2010. They're like, here's the simple seven. The first column is zero points. This is poor. So you smoke, yes, zero points. The middle column is one point. And the last column, if you're doing as good as you could be, you get two points. So the best score you could get is 14. You know, I'm like, okay, you know, that's great. Thanks. It's, it's simple. But the problem is when we look through each of these things, the smoking one's easy. Some of them are quite easy. You can calculate your BMI. It is what it is or it's not. Um, the PA, this is uh, activity, none, you know, 140, you know, or one to 140 minutes a week. Um, you know, there's a little bit of uh, leeway with this one. Healthy diet patterns, hate this one, okay? You, you eat really well, you give yourself a five, you don't eat so well, you have Big Macs every day, it's a zero. At the end of the day, they add these numbers up and we try and figure out where people fall based on these simple seven metrics. So I think that the idea behind this was good. We've got seven things, not 20. But when you start plugging it in here, we start to have a little bit of, uh, from my perspective, things kind of fall apart a little bit. Let's go to the next slide. Because the question was, or the plan was, for us to get to 20% reduction in cardiovascular disease. All right. So I have two studies that I want to talk about. Next slide. The first one is this, 20-year trend in the American Heart Association cardiovascular health score and impact on subclinical and clinical cardiovascular disease, looking at Framingham offspring study. All right, I got to back up a little bit. 1948, 5,200 men and women without coronary disease were tracked. That was the Framingham study or the Framingham study. From that, there have been many, many uh, uh, off, offshoots, off studies, one of which is the offspring study. Okay, so they take these people, and in this study, 3,400 participants, and they push them into our simple seven metrics to find out how are they doing. If we look at the date, this is eight years after we announced the simple seven. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we've got all these people, and we crunch the numbers, and it spits out this information right here. When we look at these two graphs here, there's two bell-shaped curves. The column in the middle is women. The column on the right-hand side is men. The best the men were able to get, the highest score the men got at 21.1 was eight points. 
Okay, there were some that got nine and some got 10. Very few got 14. The column in the middle is women. They peak at nine points with 16.8% of the people getting nine points. Okay, so you start to see a problem. This is Framingham information. Okay, go to the next slide. What they did, though, is they track these people over time. So we might have had fairly decent scores, but as we track them from uh, 1991 to 2008, all the people trend down. Women trended down, men trended down. And so we have a problem here. And the problem is, as we age, we start falling off this not so simple plan to try and get as close to you know, the best number we can get. Why does that happen? And, you know, I think we can ask that question. I'm going to interject a, another study here. Go to the next slide for a second. So again, first study looking at Framingham data with people who've been followed for cardiovascular uh, issues, and the bell-shaped curve is not, it's not as good as we would hope it to be. This study, heart disease and stroke statistics, a 2017, uh, 2017 update, Again, this is seven years into our simple seven plan. This does take, I mean, this is basically looking at the American Heart Association's simple seven data, okay? This is a wonderful article. If you have nothing going on on Wednesday, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about it. You should read through this. It's just fascinating. Go to the next slide for a second here. Okay, lots of words. I talk about this when I have students, but I put this big fat arrow in there. The trends with this data suggest that instead of a 20% reduction, they're projecting a 30% reduction from 2010 to 2020. Okay, next slide for just a second. This is a blank slide. Okay, why do I bring this up? One of the reasons I brought this up is because we have two really good studies. One of the studies says we're not doing so good. And in fact, as we get older, the numbers get worse. The other study, you know, coming from the American Heart Association says, we're, we're doing really good. And instead of 20% reduction, we're getting 30% reduction. And the reason I think it's important to bring this stuff up is because it depends so much on the data that you look at. I mean, I can tell you doom and gloom, you know, this Framingham data, it doesn't look like we're doing so well versus we can look at the AHA data seven years in, I'm like, this is actually pretty darn good. Let's talk about the next slide, because this one, this one shouts at you, individual responsibility. Whew. So each of us has a responsibility to try and follow these simple, these seven simple things, quit smoking, get regular activity, eat well, okay? Track your weight, Follow your, as, as a form of your BMI. Um, but we have seven things that we need to follow and it's the individual responsibility. Now you can pull other friends and family in so that you all work together. In fact, part of me at the beginning of, you know, when I was starting to do this, I'm like, print these seven things up and put them on the wall in the bathroom, put them in the kitchen. You know, if you don't smoke, you can take that one down. The problem with that though, is that you probably know someone that might smoke. And so I think keeping that up and then you yourself being an individual to try and work with your friends or family who st still smoke, I mean, you know them. Um, I think that trying to work with people to get them to change some of the habits that are not so good, working as a team is part of what this is about, part of what this talk is about. Um, the next slide is coming in from another angle, public health policies. Um, I'm not trying to get big government to take over. What I am trying to do is encourage people to do the right thing. Um, it, you know, some people are like, well, I could do whatever I want to do. I can eat that burger that you I could smoke that cigarette. You certainly can. Um, the fact of the matter is the choices that you make with respect to some of that stuff um, is going to have a significant impact on you as an individual, likely your family, um, and then also just on how much everything's costing us. So I think I am for public health policies attempting to raise taxes on things like cigarettes. Um, potentially, I mean, we're seeing it in Colorado, we raise the taxes on sugary drinks. Um, just so that, you know, if it's, it's, it's like a, I mean, they call it the, you know, the, the sin tax, 
where you do some of the stuff and it's like you can do it if you want um but there's going to be a tax to that stuff i i think that that's one way to you know and i don't want to slam people in the face but on the other hand i think if we try and get people to start making healthier choices people are going to live longer they're going to have more periods of time where they don't have cardiovascular issues okay next slide 12 years later. So in June of 2022, they finally revamped the Simple 7 and they created the Essential 8. That's basically what this whole talk, uh, you know, this is where it started. But I wanted to back up and talk about the 7 first because I think that they're each pretty important. Let's go to the next slide. Let's see if you're already there. There you are. So the Essential 8. We've done a whole lot better. These graphics are the same, but I think that we have two major components at this point in time. Health behavior which would be being active, quitting smoking, eating well, sleeping well, and then health factors, which is managing weight, controlling cholesterol, glucose, and blood pressure. So we've added sleep. Go to the next slide for a second. We'll talk just a brief amount, uh, a bit about this. There we go. So good sleep. This one's pretty simple. We're looking for seven to nine hours are recommended for adults. Um, there's this ad for a bed that swears they'll you'll have the best sleep you've ever had. Um, it's a very expensive bed. It uh, turns out it's approximately $7.23 a night for 25 years. And it's the Hastings bed. It clocks in at $66,000. Again, don't do that. Let's go to the single page uh, reference for, so next slide. Okay. So this is really important because I think... Uh, I need to read this myself, okay? Learn how sleep affects your health, okay? You don't get sleep, you don't think well. It's not good to have bad sleep. I mean, that's a pretty profound statement. Um, cognitive decline and dementia are closely linked to a lifelong period of bad sleep. Depression, higher in people who have bad sleep. High blood pressure, and this just fractions into many different uh, avenues. You know, if you have sleep apnea, We've got big problems with that. I tend to ask every single patient that comes in how their sleep health has been. How are you doing with that? This stuff on the right-hand side, the tips for success, this is where I have a problem, okay? Electronics. Um, we tend to read things at night on our phone, on our iPad, the TV. The TV is the least of the concerns because too many of us, you know, we're reading through different stuff. The blue light, they talk about, um, basically taking your phone and getting it out of the room. Get the electronics out of the room. I mean, that, that's the simple, the simplest thing I would say is get it out of the room. Put it downstairs in the kitchen, go to bed. Um, I think too much of what we're doing right now, so you read something that affects you, the light, I mean, before you know it, you don't sleep at night. And so I think anything you can do to try and get a good night's sleep where it's quiet. They talked, I, I read a study recently also about a minimal amount of light can interrupt sleep profoundly. And so we're trying to, you know, let's, it's, it's dark out and it's dark out now. Um, but I think attempting to improve how your sleep health is, is crucial. Let's try the next slide. Okay. So at the beginning of this very discombobulated, and I apologize, talk, um, I had plans to do a lot more than I'm able to do. Um, I know that there's some lag time. I know that some of these slides, I've got someone somewhere else driving my slides because we had some issues with that. We're gonna bring this all together though, because the difference between the simple seven and those seven metrics with all these points trying to get to 14 is stupid. I'm sorry, it was dumb. The, uh, my life checklist is what I want all of you to do. Now, some of you, if you saw what we were talking about, got to the website, maybe some of you did it. Um, and I would encourage everyone to get online tonight to try and do the my, uh, my Life Checklist. This is a whole lot more granular, and you can't cheat so much with this. The simple seven, you could kind of waffle your way through some of the stuff and, and maybe you're like, yeah, I got a 14. I could tell you right now, based on the information from the studies done before, very rare are the people that get a score of 14 on the, the simple seven. With this, it's a score of zero to 100, okay? So this is really nice where you plug in different metrics. Let's look at the next slide because this is a picture. I'm just going to make sure. Yeah, so this is a picture from my life checklist. 
You put your profile in. There's your health behaviors. It will walk you through each of those. My plan had been to walk through a live assessment. The problem is they want you to sign in. They want you to put your email in there. And some people have issues with that. This is a really nice assessment. I think that this is, this is beautiful for patients to see where they can work on things. Um, you know, the unfortunate thing is I would love for people to do this and then bring it into your primary care doctor or cardiology and say, you know, my, my life score is blah. The issue is, and this is really ironic, there are more patients that are doing this and understand how this works than doctors. And so if you come into your primary care doctor or cardiology and you're like, I did, you know, my, my life check, checklist assessment and I, I got a, you know, an 85. Some of the doctors might be like, what, what the heck are you talking about? So I think there's a lot of education on both sides of the fence that need to occur. From the patient perspective, for all of you that are out there listening, I think it's really important for you to see how what you do as far as behavior and factor affects the score. Um, and I think from a doctor perspective, the more physicians that are, are aware of this beautiful assessment, and, and it's very simple, I, I think that it's, it's, it's good information for patients, it's excellent information for doctors. I'd like to see this number show up you know, in doctor's notes. Next slide. We're almost done, guys. Thanks for bearing with me. When they look at the U.S., the average score of adults in the United States is an abysmal 64.7%. And the things that draw that down the most are the diet, the lack of physical activity, and the BMI. Okay, For kids, it's unfortunately even worse, 65.5%. These scores are not acceptable. And I think that when you are able to plug these numbers in at home and see what things bring your number down, this is where we're trying to go back to the slide before individual responsibility. We've got to work on trying to get you to understand where these numbers come from and how modification can be made. Next slide. This next slide is interesting. And I included this at the end of this talk as well. We've got people out there that are like, you know what? I can do all that. My genetics are terrible. Okay. I'm going to refer back to the Life Simple 7 because this one did uh, uh, some calculations to that. The, and, and I think you can extrapolate those forward with the essential eight. What they found was people who have bad genetics who are in the lowest tier, your score is like three or four, they do very poorly. If you're able to kick yourself over with modification of lifestyle into the higher tier where you're getting two points here, two points there, the likelihood that you have an increase in 20 year of cardiovascular disease free period is much higher. So this goes against some of the stuff that I talk with people about. I'm like, you know, genetics, you, you can't always, you can't, you, you can't, you can't bite genetics. You got, you can't fight them. The fact of the matter is if you look at the simple seven, now the essential eight, and you fill in your life, your life score and your numbers are high, the likelihood, even with bad genetics, the cardiovascular disease is going to be a problem. It's, you know, unfortunately, it's going to get us all at some point in time. But we can have a significant disease-free period if you're pushing yourself further into the higher score. So I think that this kind of suggests that, yes, genetics are there, but there's a lot of modifications you can make in your lifestyle that will have a rather profound effect. Um, that's basically... My talk, I think that the only thing I'd like to say, if you want to advance a couple more slides here. And so I think, how many do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. At the end of this talk, you guys should be able to get these slides. I did put several articles that I thought were just fascinating. You know, some people are like, you know, you know, some of these are quite uh, fun to read. Um, I've referenced where they come from. So I did some uh, some snapshots here so you can see a little bit about the title. If you want to go through some of the next slides, you can do that. Um, so we've got, you know, Life Simple 7. This is the first one. It's vital, but not so easy. We were talking about that before. We've also got the American Heart Association's Life Simple 7, Lifestyle Recommendations, Polygenic Risk. This is the, if you want to see something that's really amazing, this is the study that talked about how your genetics can be altered significantly by pushing yourself into the higher tier with the simple seven. Um, the next one, forecasting future of cardiovascular disease. This is a very, 
big uh, article. This is massive. Um, but if you if you really want to have some fun, um, I think that this is a it's 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 riveting. And coming from a cardiologist, I'm like it really is. It's in bite sized pieces. It's amazing. It's 20 year trends, the American Heart Association health score impact on clinical cardiovascular disease. Once again, this is Framingham. Uh, this is another one, uh, 2022 update report from American Heart Association. Um, this one's this was uh, hot off the press about a year ago, but it's still wonderful information. The last two uh, articles, um, sleep duration and risk factor for cardiovascular disease. This one, it causes you to bang your head on the wall, okay? They came out with Simple 7 in 2010. If you look at when this was published, you see this was published in February of 2010. So someone was on to the fact that sleep duration should be a risk factor, probably should be included in the Simple 7, wasn't included in Simple 7, okay? 12 years later, it finally inches its way on as the Essential 8. I don't know what to tell you about that one. And then the last one's just kind of a, a fun little article. This was written by Akira Indo. This is the gentleman who basically brought statins, um, you know, to the forefront. Um, this is a fun little article. I know some of you are like, oh, my God, I hate statins. You know, this doctor's crazy. It truly is an interesting article coming from someone as to how he came about, about you know, getting information to where he came from, a little farm in Japan. Um, but I think that these are just some fun articles that I think are kind of fun uh, to read through and it had a lot to do with where some of the information from this study came from. So without further ado, I honest to God do not know if anyone's going to pop back on. If they do pop on, maybe we won't be able to hear them. Um, I think however many of you stuck with it uh, to watch this uh, tonight, um, I would, again, encourage you to go to the American Heart Association website. Um, I think that trying to get people to go on and do the calculation for yourself, uh, is, it's, it's just something you should do. I think it's very, it, it's eye-opening um, and I would encourage you. So yeah, my life checklist from the American Heart Association um, is just fascinating. Doctor, uh Shots, I do have a few questions for you. One question a, a guest had was, are palpitations considered a likely precursor to heart attack? So what was that again? Are, are what? Are palpitations, palpitations considered a likely precursor, ah. precursor to heart attack? You know, the short answer is no. Um, I think that, you know, palpitations can be indicative of a, a lot of different things. I mean, certainly palpitations could be indicative of stress. Uh, if there's a lot of stress and there's been a lot of stress for a lot of people these, you know, these past few years. Um, I think palpitations are the way, you know, it's one way for the heart to kind of suggest that uh, there's something going on. So palpitations, are, it's, that's a very uh, nebulous term. Uh, because some are quite benign, some are a little bit more of concern. Um, but I think if you pause and you step back and you think to yourself, is there something stressful going on? Did I get a good night's sleep? You know, am I drinking more coffee than normal? You know, did I cut from five cups of coffee down to one? Um, you know, things like that. So I, I think that the short answer is not necessarily, but I think the long-winded answer is there's a bunch of different things that can factor in with people having palpitations. Uh, are heart disease screening tests recommended for people with otherwise low identifiable risk factors due to their high rate of false positives? That's a great question. And I like the statement afterward as well. You know, uh, I think the fact of the matter is you, you do need to weigh a bunch of factors. If you come from a family where you don't have premature coronary disease, you don't have high cholesterol, your BMI is normal, you don't smoke, um, you eat well, you exercise, and your sleep is good. I mean, I'm trying to hit all those different metrics we talked about tonight. The likelihood that you're going to have a high yield from that study is low. I, I don't think that people, um, you know, there, there's nothing written that says at the age of 50, go get a heart scan. There's, there's nothing that says that. 
I, I think that if you come from a strong family history of heart disease and you have some other notable risk factors, you know, things like the heart scan uh, may shed some light on whether or not some of the things that you don't think are a problem um, truly are a problem and should be uh, more aggressively modified, uh, like blood pressure. You know, if you have borderline blood pressure, your cholesterol, is, it, you know, according to what you've been told is okay. I think that if you have a family history and you do supplement with some of these cardiovascular tests that suggest that you are a little bit more in a higher risk, there is some benefit. But I, I think that that's where this uh, life score comes in. I think that if your score is quite high uh, and your family history is is pretty good, um, the likelihood that you know a cardiovascular study is going to shed some light on something that's um, you know gravely concerning is low. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a great question, and I, I especially like the little tidbit of information afterward. I, I think that you know we don't need to test everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> this guest says, I have occasional mild left side chest pain. Should I be concerned? Well, there's always more to the story, you know, and more to the story. What I mean by that is, you know, do you get this in certain situations? Do you get this after eating certain foods? Is this with an activity? Um, is it after you get off the phone with your mother-in-law uh, or your father-in-law, you know, stuff like that? Um, so I think it's situational where we'd kind of like to know a little bit more about when it's noted. How long has it been going on? Has it been getting worse? Um, are there certain things you do that make it worse? And then also, are there things you do that make it better? Um, I think, you know, we've got a lot of people coming in these days with this, you know, this very symptom as a question. And I think it's, you know, it's up, up to us to spend the time to kind of talk through people what might be the cause for that symptom. And there's a possibility at the end of the conversation that we talk about doing some form of a cardiovascular test. But I think that there's a lot more to that simple statement um, that needs to be pulled out. Thank you. This this uh, guest asks: Is there a difference between sodium and table salts regarding my health? Well, I mean, table salt is sodium chloride. Um, you know, I I guess I'm trying to think what that question, what uh, a secondary meaning for that question. Um, as far as like maybe measuring your sodium with your metabolic profile. Um, there's a big difference. Um, those are not the same at all. Because um, the sodium that's measured is not, uh, it's not generally related to the, to the, the table salt as, uh, that you have. Um, so the table salt is the thing that's going to, you know, potentially raise your blood pressure, uh, things like that. But your sodium level, as far as a lab, is more the electrolyte that we're looking at within your within your system. So those are two different things. Um, and I'm trying to think how else that question might have been. And maybe, I, maybe I'm answering the question with, with what I've stated, but table salt is sodium chloride. Uh, too much of that's bad. The sodium they measure, um, there is a normal range. Um, and if you're in that normal range, I mean, that's, that's where we'd like you to be. Um, yeah, not sure if I answered that question for or the person that was asking it. I think so. Uh, a, a, uh, a guest asked, what about um, the conflicting information about is red wine good for you ah, or not? Right. I was hoping that one wouldn't your come thoughts up. thoughts about that? Okay. So, so the way that I feel about alcohol has changed. Um, I used to say a glass of wine is probably fine. You know, and once again, maybe one or two a week. I think at the end of the day, there's more and more information. And I know people are closing their, their computers, they're turning stuff off right now. I, I think that unfortunately, any amount of alcohol probably is not good. Um, now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go have a glass of wine or your gin and tonic. Um, you know, and this is where I might pull the, uh, you know, uh, everything in moderation string hard. Um, 
And it says something when the country just north of us um, has some policies in place for alcohol. Um, I think it, the other thing that needs to be stated is that everyone's definition on moderate or a glass of wine is different. And so with that being said, you know, there are good things, you know, that are, uh, there are some good things in red wine. Do you need to drink the red wine to get those good things? The, the short answer with that is no. Um, and so, yeah, and I'm probably got a lot of people rolling their eyes and, and, and I'm okay with that. I, I think that if you don't drink, don't start. If you do drink, let's talk about how much you do. You know, if you have a glass of wine with dinner once a week, it's probably okay. Um, and I think that this is a question that should be asked yearly for the next 10 or 15 years as well. You know, we've been drinking for thousands of years. Um, you know, is this the apple that was presented in the Garden of Eden? I, I don't know. Um, but I think that if moderation or less is implemented with respect to alcohol, you're, you're probably going to be okay. Um, if you look at yourself in the mirror and you think to yourself, I, I, I probably have too many drinks, you know, I'm having seven drinks a week, you know, three on Saturday, you know, there's probably a problem. Um, and I think that the first thing is not you're a bad person. The first thing is we'll just cut back a little bit, you know, cut it back. Um, you know, I, I'm a fan of the dry January thing. I think it's a nice way for people to see how they feel. Um, you know, again, refer back to individual responsibility. If you do dry January and you sleep better, you exercise better, you feel better, you're not cranky. I mean, you don't need to ask a doctor, you know, what the right thing to do is. I think, you know, so I would say go by how you feel, but I also think that less is better. Thank you. Uh, a guest asks or makes the comment that isn't BMI becoming an out of date method for gauging our health? You know, it is, but it isn't. I think that the reason I like it is because you can use it in some of these metrics to try and find out a little bit more about where you settle. Um, I did do a little bit of reading on that. And I, you know, there was a part of me that was like, maybe we should just pull this out. You know, I, the problem is I can't. I mean, this is part of the simple seven and the essential eight. Um, and it is something that reduces uh, a weight that you are and your height into a, a reproducible number. I mean, this, that's a great point, um, and there is some gaining grounds on uh, nixing or doing away with the BMI. Um, but I think for the argument of this discussion, I left it in just so that we could say, because it will come up if you do, you know, your life, uh, uh, your life uh, score. I think it's a good thing to put in there. Now, with that being said, the life score also takes into consideration, you know, simply your weight and your height. Um, so great point. Um, I'm glad that someone brought that up. You know, we're, we're seeing where that's evolving right now. Um, I think I like it because it does kind of, maybe it oversimplifies, but I do like the way that it simplifies uh, some metrics down. Great point though. Thank you. Thank you for that response. So um, a viewer asked, do we as do we assume that marijuana smoking also applies to the snot smoking recommendation? Yeah. Yeah. And I've had conversations with that uh, or about that with patients as well. I think at the end of the day, smoking anything's bad, period. Um, you know, I had someone ask, well, you know, what if I smoke marijuana through a, a really big bong, you know, so I don't get all the toxic chemicals and I'm like, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, and, and the marijuana talk does, it brings something totally different into the discussion. Um, you know, am I anti that? I, I'm not. Am I for everyone using it? Absolutely not. I think smoking anything's bad, period. You know, vapes are bad. E-cigarettes bad. Tobacco in general, you know, cigarette, unfiltered, you know, whatever you want. It's, it's all, it's not good. You know, if there's smoke in the air and you're breathing it in, all that smoke is particulate. It's it's not good. Um, you know, it sounds like there's a little bit of a trying to get me to comment more on that. But uh, what I see when I hear the marijuana thing come in, I'm like, okay, okay. So I'm not going to smoke marijuana, but I, I, the edibles. Um, you know, and I think that, again, that's, that's Pandora's box. Um, you know, it opens up. Um, I, there's a lot of studies being done, and I think more studies need to be done with that. 
um, because I think that there are medicinal things that are poorly understood with respect to that. Um, you know, I think Colorado is great that they legalized it. I think that, you know, look at all the other states that are doing the same. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if you say smoke this, don't do it. Thank you. Regarding blood pressure, uh, what are acceptable measures of blood pressure during daily activity? You know, 120 over 80 at, is where it should be at rest, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that's a good, that's a good question as well. Uh, you know, this is what I have to say. I think that we all are active at different levels. And I think that, um, you know, and you could also say the same thing because in Europe, they don't recommend fasting for cholesterol. I, I, it's not that they recommend, they don't need it. Um, and so I think what we're trying to do when we say resting blood pressure or fasting is we're trying to find out what your foundation is. You know, where are you starting from? Because the fact of the matter is if, if you're sitting in a chair and it's quiet and you're calm and your blood pressure is 114 over 68, you get up and run up the stairs, your blood pressure is going to go up. It's going to go up. You go exercise, your blood pressure goes up. Um, but I think when, you know, and, you know, the other challenging thing is when are things calm anymore? You know, when are people not running around or trying to get there, trying to get here? You know, kids are screaming, all this stuff. Um, I think that what we're looking to do is find something that is reproducible across across the population. Um, and I think that, you know, with respect to the cholesterol as well, if you're fasting for 12 hours, where does your cholesterol sit? Where do you start, you know, before, you know, you go get your in and out four by four burger, you know, to shoot your cholesterol way up. So I think that the importance in this is to kind of know where things are for your baseline. Um, because yeah, if you were to do blood pressure, we do this when we do the treadmill, when we do exercise treadmill stress tests, we have a blood pressure cuff and all these blood pressure generally in a normal situation, they go up. Um, and so I think that the premise behind this is to see where you start um, and, and not to necessarily run around the house and then park yourself for a minute and get your blood pressure checked. It, it's gonna be higher. Um, so great question, but I think the idea behind it is to know where people start with respect to blood pressure, as well as with respect to cholesterol. Thank you. We're running a little over time because we got such a bumpy uh, late start, but we do have time for a few more questions. Um, about baby aspirin, uh, does low dose aspirin really help prevent heart problems? So let's talk about aspirin um, because that has changed. Um, and I think it's changed for, for the good. If a person, a patient has known heart disease, and, and let's be specific about what I mean by this. If you have a bypass surgery, if you have a stent, uh, from my perspective, barring an issue with uh, stomach ulcers and bleeding and all that, where it's a known big problem, you probably ought to be on a low-dose aspirin. Gone are the days where we used to say, you know, every male over the age of 50 should be on low-dose aspirin. You know, females over the age of 60, you probably needed to be on a baby aspirin for preventive cardiology. We don't do that anymore. There are far more people that are going to have a bleeding complication with that idea um, than ultimately having, you know, what we thought or what was initially rumored to be uh, diminished cardiovascular issues. So if you have known heart disease with stents or bypass, and I'm just picking on those two, baby aspirin. If you have no known heart disease, um, you probably ought not to be on a baby aspirin. Now, with that being said, if you go get a heart scan, and, and if any of my partners are watching this, they're like, oh my God, he's going there. Um, there are some studies that suggest if your calcium burden is high in the hundreds, that you might benefit from being on low-dose aspirin. I think that there's some more work to be done to find out exactly whether or not that's true. But I think what they've done with that recommendation is they're looking at people that are higher risk uh, and then trying to figure out with that higher risk if the addition of aspirin um, is something that helps. So I think there are some studies that are going on with respect to that. But again, gone are the days where we're like, male over the age of 50, low-dose aspirin. Uh, do not do that. Uh, that, is, that is not recommended any longer. Um, 
So I think uh, as far as taking aspirin, just because you're like, oh, I'm a high risk, I think go see your doctor and find out if that's true. Um, because there's a lot of people with a lot of risks where they actually might be elevating the risk for something else to happen rather than cardiovascular protection. Right, thank you. So uh, I've gotten some questions about calcium. Um, one question is, why aren't we talking about calcium scores or craft tests? And how concerned should a I be with a coronary calcium uh, score of 1191? Oh, okay. Um, well, that's two, those are two questions. Let's talk about both those for a second. Um, I, I was not in the past as big a fan of the calcium score as I've become. Um, you know, I, um, I think that I find that that is a nice intro study that allows us to know a little bit more about what might be going on. Um, if you've ever seen me, uh, as your physician or been with someone who is seeing me, I think you'll hear me say, you know, the calcium score is very sensitive, but not at all specific. So it's very good at picking up people who have laid down coronary calcium. The downside is it does not pick up at all on soft plaque. Now, with that being said, if you have coronary calcification and your score is you know, very, very low, there's a high likelihood that there is some soft plaque in the vicinity of that calcified plaque. Um, so I, I am a big fan of using this study to find out whether or not people have the process started. I'm also a very big fan of saying one and done. I have had patients that come in, they get the calcium score every year. I am not for that at all. I think if you have a calcium score and it's positive, it's going to be positive if we check it again. You know, I think that you could look at repeating this possibly at five years, probably more likely at 10. Um, and again, you know, if, if you get a calcium score and your score is 25, let's just start with a really low number. So you're off to the races. The process has started. This is where we look at each of these different risk factors. We want to be aggressive with blood pressure. We want to be aggressive with cholesterol. We want you to eat well. We want to work on sleep. We want to try and get your weight down. Okay. We want you to quit smoking if you do. I want you to follow up on what your glucose level is. So I think it's a nice way for us to say something has started. We want to be more aggressive. Now for the patient who called in and their score is a thousand or whatever, um, the fact of the matter is back in the day when we used to do this and we had a really high calcium score, unfortunately, we took a lot of people to the cath lab and the cath lab being where we uh, go in through one of the arteries and we shoot some contrast to see where all the blockage is because we know it's there. There were uh, many patients with high scores who did not have critical blockage. They had 20 or 30 percent. And it has to do a lot with where the calcium is laid down. Not all the calcium is laid down inside the vessel. Some of it's in the vessel wall. Um, and, you know, honestly, we're still trying to figure out how we're going to figure that all out. I mean, so there are other studies that can be done. Um, one of the studies is a coronary, a CT, uh, a CTA, uh, which is what I call the radiology equivalent of a heart cath, um, which is where you get contrast and we do a, a CT scan. So this is contrast. The heart scan is just a CT scan looking at calcium burden. The CTA is basically that study with some uh, contrast added in. Um, but I think that, you know, knowing what you know when that study is done helps us to try and figure out what we need to modify. You know, am I worried for this person with a score of 1,000? Well, I think you got to step back and look at what risks they have. You know, are we modifying these risks? You know, is the blood pressure control, the cholesterol control? Where is the diabetes activity? Um, so I, I try really hard when we talk with people about their scores to not have them think that the time bomb, you know, is ticking because it's not about that. I think that this is raising the awareness on what might be going on for us to try and figure out what we need to modify so we can keep you on the primary prevention side, you know, rather than secondary prevention, which is that something's happened, you got a stent, you got bypass, you know, 
so I think a lot of it has to do with that. I mean, this question came up today, actually, where they were like, you know, and I've got, like I said, I've got patients that come in, they get a heart scan every year. And I'm like, don't do that. Don't do it. It's radiation that you just don't need. Um, so I think that the heart scan is a great, you know, one and done, very binary. And by that, I mean, you either have it or you don't. I mean, it's, you have a score of zero or you have a score of one. And, and as far as one goes, pick a number. Um, but I think that pulls a trigger on how aggressive we want to be with risk factor modification.